In my presentation, I'm going to discuss first two main ideas, and each one of these ideas can be taken uh, separately, and you can reject the other one, or you can reject both, of course. But if you accept that both of these ideas are possible, in the third section, I'm going to discuss a reason why they might both be possible at the same time. My first section, Are There Optics in the Voynich, deals with these um, somewhat iconic representations in the Voynich. Many people have called them cylinders. Um, some people have called them jars. I like to call them cylinders because I don't know if they're jars or what they are. They've been, they've been called many different things. People have assumed they've been many different things. But um, it might surprise you if looking at this particular cylinder here that I can tell you that I know for a fact that this is actually a microscope. That was somewhat of a trick, I suppose, because actually the reason I can say that is because I drew it. And I drew the image sort of in the style of the Voynich cylinders, but I drew it of an actual microscope that existed in the 17th century, a Spanish microscope, a twin lens microscope. And the point, of course, is that if you draw a microscope in the style of the Voynich cylinders with all the details of the Voynich s of the microscope and it looks like a Voynich cylinder, it, it makes the case somewhat that uh, these actually may be microscopes we see in the Voynich. In this uh, slide on the left you see two actual Voynich cylinders and on the right you see um, one of the Spanish microscopes I showed you before but also um, another one from the same catalog of 17th century Spanish microscopes. You'll notice that the actual microscopes have parallel sides and this is so that the tubes can slide in on one another and that's also the reason for the multiple diameters, the little rings that you see so that they can be focused. You, know, you can slide one tube inside the other. Well, interestingly the actual Voynich cylinders very often have parallel sides and multiple diameters like that. These are not really like jar-like um, features, but I think that they are optical features. Also you'll notice that they have recessed tops and the recessed tops is also an optical feature, very often seen on uh, microscopes and telescopes even to this day actually. But if you'll notice also they have like a greenish tint or a greenish blue tint and this happens very often. Um, that's actually also something that's found on early optical devices because they had sort of impurities in the glass. Sometimes they were put there on purpose or whatever, but there were impurities that gave them these kind of green tints or blue tints. And also the ends of the uh, cylinders in the Voynich have these kind of ringed ends. And if you look at the Spanish microscopes again, you see these same ringed ends. And the reason is that they were usually turned out of wood and slid into the tubes and then the lenses were slid inside of them. So they had like a ridge so that they wouldn't slide into the tube completely. And here I have a selection of various 17th century optical devices. Actually, um, one of them in the upper right is um, possibly even a 16th century device from 1595, the Janssen scope, which is actually metal uh, with a leather covered metal center section. But again, you have the parallel sides and um, you have the multiple diameters. The other devices you can see are either you know early to mid and some late 17th century devices. You can see the colorings very similar to the Voynich. They even have little legs that they sit on. Um, the one in the lower left is a Campani which is very uh, similar to many of the Voynich cylinders. And then you see the black and white engraving in the bottom row is actually Kircher's um, microscope. This is the actual one that Kircher used in the 15, I'm sorry, the 1650s and uh, about the time that he owned the Voynich, he would have probably still had this microscope, which I think is kind of interesting. It looks a lot like a Voynich tube, and I often do wonder what, it, what he made of the uh, similarity, if you noticed it. And here is another uh, example of a similarity between an actual microscope from the 17th century and a Voynich uh, cylinder. I'm not saying that that cylinder in the Voynich is that microscope, but I just think it's very interesting that you have similar proportions, coloration, the multiple diameters again, um, some of the decorative element, and even the brown coloring at the top uh, happens to be very close to the, the idea of there being a wooden end on these uh, microscopes. It's on the, on the actual microscope, it is a brown wood, and then you show very often on the Voynich cylinders, parts of them will have this kind of reddish brown, 
uh, look to them. Also, I want to note that in the bottom of the Voynich cylinder you see the little lines, which I do wonder if that could be knurling, because on early microscopes you had like knurling so that you could grab the sections, get a good grip on the sections, and either disassemble them or move them for focusing and so on. And you do see that in many of the Voynich cylinders. You'll see little lines which may denote uh, knurling like of this type. This is a selection, it's not, of course, all of them, but it's a selection of Voynich cylinders, which have been called jars. Now, understand that I, I do agree that many of the cylinders in the Voynich could be jars, and they look more like jars. There are some that look like Egyptian perfume jars. Keith Body had pointed this out to me, that uh, that some of them do look like Egyptian perfume jars and other types of jars, and I agree with that assessment. But many of the cylinders in the Voynich have the same things that I've pointed out here before, these same features of multiple diameters and recessed tops and multicolored um, recessed tops which might denote lenses and so on. Um, interestingly also the center top image, if you notice, it has almost looks like fins coming out. Many of the legs on these Voynich cylinders are, sometimes they look fins, sometimes they look like uh, little little blobs, but there's a very common feature found on early furniture, early 17th century furniture, and even scientific devices, and even on microscopes, found on microscopes, and that's known as the delphini, or the dolphin uh, motif. And sometimes it'll be shown with the fin facing down, sometimes the head facing down. I think a lot of the legs on these um, Voynich cylinders are a good match for the uh, delphini motif. Now, long before I thought that there may be microscopes or optical devices in the Voynich. Others before me, uh, even long before I was born, were already saying and wondering at the similarity between many of the objects in the Voynich and microscopic organisms. Um, diatoms were suggested. I don't know specifically if the one I show here on the left, this wheel, this Voynich wheel, was one of the ones, but it, it certainly looks a lot like a diatom to me. If you notice and look at the 19th century diatom engraving on the right, the way the spokes look, the thick spokes, the thin spokes, and the rings around the outside with the little lozenge-like shape on the Voynich wheel match up with the arches of the diatom. And even the star, which is represented at the center of the Voynich wheel on the diatom engraving, you don't see the whole star. It's kind of a, misses that detail, but that detail would be there in an actual diatom. You can see the points of such a star, and um, so on. I think it's a very, very close match. The um, similarities between the diatom and the Voynich wheel become even more apparent when you overlay the um, Voynich wheel over the diatom. The Voynich wheel is in green. The various diameters then, it becomes very apparent that the actual proportion of the diameters is very close. The length of the spokes, the distance to the lozenge wheel, and even the overall proportion to the outermost wheel is, is matched exactly by the row of um, writing on, on the uh, Voynich wheel. In this case, you can see the Voynich, quote-unquote, sunflower. One of the plants in the Voynich is a very odd root, which has been called many different things. Uh, there's been a lot of suggestions for what that might be. But as you can see in this illustration, again, with a in 19th century microscopic image of a marine organism, there's a very close similarity, including the color. The color, the proportions, the little tubular-like things poking out, it's very similar in a lot of ways. And these aren't the only ones. The, the book is filled with, the Voynich is filled with the images that look a lot like um, microscopic cells, cell structures, and so on. And uh, like I say, long before I thought there might be um, optics in the Voynich, people have wondered at this. So that was an overview of the idea um, that there may be optics in the Voynich. But here's a second section, which could be taken again, like I say, could be taken separately. Um, it's the idea that the Voynich, and I feel that it's a fantasy book. I feel it reflects some sort of fantasy. And I don't mean that in the sense that somebody drew it, wrote it, intended it to be real, but just made made errors in it, made a mistake, and they had their, whatever their... Um, you know, botany wrong and so on, but actually that it was never intended to be real or reflect anything real. 
And so I'd like to give some reasons why I think that that, that might be the case. First of all, looking at the, the overview here of the Rosettes page, I made this 3D representation of the Rosettes page, not theory specific to my theory, but just in general for people so they could see what, what I think that the artist that made the Rosettes was intending. This is, this is uh, proportional. Some people might say the, the hills could be you know, taller or lower or whatever, but proportionally to each other. This is basically what the perspective and that's shown on the Rosettes page was intended by the author, I think. And I just, a lot of people call this a real map, and they say, well, it's a real place somewhere, and they try to look for the various castles and the layouts and so on of this um, map. I mean, it is a map, and, and they look for actual real places that, that it might be. The, the trouble is, as I see it, when people do look for the real places, such as the castle in the foreground, you can see in the foreground the castle and the courtyard and the wall, Behind it, you see the Onion Dome Towers, and of course, various places have been suggested for that. But when they're looking for the actual castle and the towers, they're not looking for those gigantic tubes that are sticking out of the hillside. I mean, I don't think that you can really pick and choose. If you believe this is a real place, you should look for the towers, the tubes also, when you're looking for the towers. Not that anyone's actually even found any towers that look uh, quite like that, or the castle. Stylistically, they're similar to things. I know they've found the Swallowtail Merlins, and these things are very important to find the various architectural elements in real life, but nobody's found these places in real life, and certainly not the gigantic tubes. Here is another um, case, in, in, in uh, I feel, for fantasy, and that's the tower in the hall, which I call a visual oxymoron. I mean, it would be impractical, actually pointless, to build a tower deep down in the bottom of a hole, but there you go. Now, I know that the um, Ethiopian Church of St. George has been suggested to me that, you know, it's carved down in rock, but that's a church carved down in rock. It doesn't, you know, extend up above it. Um, or I've also heard about buildings being built around other buildings, so they're lower than the, you know, the highest building and so on. But again, there's a reason for that. This actually is a tower built in a hole, and I think that like a screen door in a submarine, it's it's something that doesn't make sense. It's something that points to fantasy. And I believe that that's the intent. This was drawn as a fantasy image, not a real place. I think that's the implication. Here's another example. Um, it's a more recent example. An independent researcher, Tim Tatry, uh, contacted the Beinecke to find out what was in the fold on the Rosettes page. It's between the castle that I was showing before and the Onion Domes. And so they spread the fold, and they took this very nice high-resolution picture, and it turns out there's a little mountain in there, and there's stuff spewing out of the top of the mountain. Now, it's blue. It's not like a volcano, although it does look like a volcano. Maybe it's meant to be a fountain, or who knows what it's supposed to be. But it's another example. If you're looking for the castle and the you know, onion domes, and you're looking for the castle to be in a real place, you should look for a mountain that looks quite like that, spewing things out of the top. And again... My point is that you're not going to probably find that, and there's a, probably a reason for it. It's, a, it's, to me, another indication that this is a, a fantasy place depicted in a fantasy map, the Rosettes. But, um, of course, the Voynich as a whole, when you add it all up, it, it seems to, as a, as a total, as some total is, is, is saying that this is a fantasy book. Um, when you think that all the plants are unidentifiable, it's like, yes, well, some parts look sort of like real plants, but then they're kind of scrambled up. They might have the wrong leaf or the wrong root. And the animals, some of them identifiable, but, you know, like the ones in the Zodiac. But many of the animals are a little bit hard to make out. What exactly are they? They look strange. They don't look real. The places, as I, as I pointed out in the Rosette's pages, they're, they don't, they're not real places. They've never been found. Objects in the Voynich, some are identifiable, like the crossbow is identifiable, but very often the people are holding weird objects that match nothing in real life. Language and writing, that's a no-brainer, obviously. That's the biggest problem right there. And the Zodiac, it's kind of in a funny order. Maybe they use the wrong animal, um, the wrong imagery for the Zodiac. It doesn't quite make sense. Uh, the constellations, okay, well, maybe you'll find uh, the Seven Sisters. Other people have seen other, you know, constellations which may match up to real ones, but all in all, you're lost then, because after that, they just don't make any sense. They don't look like real constellations. 
the symbols in the Voynich, if there are any real symbols in the Voynich, you see like uh, bunches of grapes maybe, you see a crucifix, you see a man holding like a fleur de lis, another man is holding a, a sphere with a funny little cone on the top. It, they're not actual symbols to any real things that we know of, or they're certainly unidentifiable as any particular uh, s symbol, you know. And then, of course, this all adds up to all the mixed and unidentifiable cultures, the weird hats, the weird clothing, and so on. Y people have said maybe it's from the Middle East, maybe it's from Northern Europe, um, and so on. It's, you really can't identify the culture. So when you add all of these things up and you look at them, I think it very strongly points to the idea that this is all in all meant to be a fantasy document, possibly of some fantasy place, fictional story, or mythology. So, like I said, in parts one and part two, you have the idea of optics, you have the idea that it's a fantasy document, and um, you may accept one, or may accept both, or, or reject both, but if you think that it is possible that this is a fantasy document with optics in it, what would that mean? What would be the implications of seeing both together? Where would we, f who would do that? Where would we find it? Why would it be done? And I'd like to suggest a reason um, why that might be. In the early part of the 17th century, there was a great interest in the idea of the microscope and the telescope possibly solving some of the old questions and problems that uh, people had about the, um, you know, the natural world around them, such as the connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm, the idea that the patterns in the smallest parts of nature might match the patterns um, that they could see with the naked eye, but also the things they could see through a telescope now, and that these, an these questions might be answered now with these new devices. This idea found its way into the mythologies of the time, such as the manifestos of the Rosicrucian movement, which also contained, uh, very often they contained like um, uh, cipher, the idea of the lost books of ancient lore, which might also contain answers to questions that people were having. And in the tomb of Christian Rosencruz, there was the, the discovery of perspective glasses, meaning microscopes and telescopes, meaning optics. And this wasn't by accident. These, these ideas were very exciting to the Rosicrucians also, who, were in, who had incorporated them into their mythology as kind of a hope for a new scientific revival. Here we have um, four major utopias which were written from the early part of the 16th century through the 17th century. And they don't all contain specifically um, information or, or descriptions of optical devices. But the idea was that they were fantasy places that were the idea of new societies, very often scientifically based, which had allegorical representations of alchemical formulas and things like that in them. As you can see, Thomas More's in the upper right actually contains the idea of cipher. In the lower right, you see Christ, uh, Andreas, Johannes Andreas's um, Christianopolis. And in that one, uh, he was actually, he actually confessed to having written one of the Rosicrucian manifestos, interestingly. He also smuggled out the, when Tom, Tommaso Campanella was in prison, he smuggled out the draft of the City of the Sun, seen in the upper left there, uh, because uh, Campanella was in prison and and Andrea actually smuggled the draft out so that it could be published. And here we have an illustration of Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, one of the most well-known utopias. It's actually a 1970s engraving. But the, the idea is with these utopias that they were imaginative fictions or mythologies that were meant to project an idea for an ideal society. Very often, again, scientifically based where the, um, the rulers would basically give like, uh, like, like patr patronage to the sciences and support the sciences. And also various, you know, political ideas were played out in these utopias. But basically, each one of them had the idea of mythical places and um, mythical buildings and societies and sciences. And in the case of Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, you had the ideas of actually flying machines and submarines and grafted plants and the idea of creating new plants from uh, by combining other plants together and even animals, making new animals that had never been seen before. So it was filled with a lot of uh, ideas like that. It, e it even had castles and walled cities and 
a lot of very imaginative um, ideas were played out in this uh, particular utopia. And here I show um, four utopias next to the Rosettes page, and the point being that, like those utopias, I believe the actual Rosettes page is meant to be a fantasy place. And this is not an idea that was, it's, that's so outrageous. It's an idea that was very common to the people of the 16th and 17th centuries. The idea of, of m you know, myth mythological societies, mythological places, and mythological maps. And you can see that there's kind of a similarity to those when you compare them side by side. Another indication of just how important some of these concepts were was how they found their way into other arts and literature. On the upper left there you see Faust from Christopher Marlowe's 1592 Faust. And in the play he's actually holding a, a lost book of ancient knowledge, a uh, book of great power. And um, then on the right you see John Gielgud holding um, one of Prospero's books. He's playing Prospero there. And in The Tempest, you also have the idea of the, the commonwealth, the utopia, and the idea of lost books of ancient knowledge filled with um, powerful uh, information that would um, possibly uh, help a person to, you know, answer questions or to control their lives or to control the lives around them. The point I'm making here with this uh, slide is that I think that if you took a group of artists that knew nothing of the Voynich and had them study each one of these separate disciplines and said, make a book to look like it came from Faust and Prospero from the plays The Tempest and Faust, it would look very much like um, the Voynich. And I also feel the same thing would happen if you had someone study the early Rosicrucian movement and the influences and you asked them to make a book M as found in the tomb of Rosencruz. And the same with the New Atlantis. If you had somebody make a book to look as though it came from the, the mythical New Atlantis, the island of Bensalem, it would have all the plants of the world and they'd be very strange plants and all uh, strange animals and you'd have cipher, you'd have optics, you'd have pools, fountains, towers, a walled city and so on. W well if you took all of those books that these artists made I think they would look pretty much like one another and I, and I really don't think they would look all that different than a Voynich manuscript. In summary, I'd suggest that the Voynich may be an artifact of proto-scientific utopian fiction, that it might have been created by someone to represent some literature or mythology from the late 16th through the early 17th century. Maybe it was done as a tribute or simply an art form, or maybe it was even created to fool someone into believing that there one of these places actually existed. I don't know who might have d done it, but I do feel the interest and excitement was certainly in existence at this time and it was a sufficient motivation to spark such a creation as a voyage uh, for, for the reasons that I've outlined.